Yes, welcome back. And guess who we have in the studio? You just saw her singing there. Do you remember who that is? Miata Fambule, the librarian known as D.D. Duanya mm. Diva. Mm. She's right here in the studio. <laughs> welcome, Miata. Thank you, and it's good, good to be to here. Good to have you with us. Yes. Cool, that name goes back, way, way back. Back. When back. you were a hot, hot, hot <laughs> diva. Wait, I'm not hot anymore. You are still <laughs> very hot. <laughs> <laughs> that was a year and a half ago. We still, you know, but um, yes, we've gone on be beyond You're the hot slowing stage. down. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, it's good to have Miata with us in the studio. She was born in uh, Monrovia, Liberia. And she was educated in England, Sierra Leone, Kenya, and the United States. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, in the music scene of those days, I mean, she was one of the hottest African singers, along with um, Makiba. Yes. I mean, we're so honored to have you in the studio with oh, us this morning. Oh, come on. Na you know, I, I say Nigeria is my home away from home, so. Oh, well, we know you have loads of friends <laughs> in Nigeria. <laughs> Now, tell us about how the whole music thing started for you. My grandmother used to take me to church. You know, she was part of this evangelical um, aladura. Yes, every day this woman would go to vigil and stuff, and she would track me this with her. This is in Liberia. This is in Liberia. Okay. Yes, and uh, I loved the music. I must have been about five, six. You know, I couldn't understand anything they were talking. Not that I was even really interested, <laughs> uh, you know. But I loved the music, the harmony. And so I didn't object going to those services. So you actually just went there to enjoy the music? I did. I did. I have to be very <laughs> honest. Did Grandma sing? Um, not really. Grandma was more into... The dancing. You know, dancing <laughs> and praise the Lord. Oh, yes. <laughs> so there was no singing in the family at all before oh no you no came no, no no that's there's plenty of singing in the family on both sides uh on my father's side i have i had an aunt who was like a celebrated singer in the rural area okay she came from the village traditional singer i met her years later because i didn't know of her and then on my mother's side uh, they've come out of this Episcopal uh, uh, denomination, and my mother was in the choir, mm. and my cousin played the keyboard. So yes, and and now, um, out of my siblings, like I have a brother in America, all his children sing, and yeah, it's part of the family now. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, now how did you discover your talent? I didn't discover it. People just said, you can sing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people know. discovered it for yeah, you. Yeah, they discovered it for me. And I will tell you something. Even after 40-something years, and I hear myself and I, and I watch tapes and things, I, I still ask, you know, can I really sing? I do ask that. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, but in spite of asking that, uh -huh. you went ahead and sang. Yes, uh, it comes. It comes naturally. It, 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 it's easier. It's easy for me to do. And you know, I, I figure, being a lawyer or a doctor, uh, something serious like that was just going to be too tedious for my temperament. <laughs> <laughs> now, there was this. Uh, there, there was this story that's been told so many times that your parents did not really encourage you to sing. Yeah, well, back in the 60s, um, which, which parent wanted their child, daughter to sing? Wanted their daughter to sing, yeah, you know. Right. Uh, Daddy Dear was ambassador, Sierra Leone, Kenya, and, you know, spent his money in putting me in the best of schools. And then, and then uh, you decide to sing. Yeah, I mean, and, and all on. I wanted to really you can do, do better than sing. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, what happened to being a doctor? Yeah, that's, that's it, you know. It, it, um, Initially, my family was like, what did, where did we go wrong with her? <laughs> she wants to sing. Ah, but I think, luckily for me, um, 
Miriam Makeba had appeared on the stage. And for West Africa, we're all from West Africa, um, it was the first time an African woman, you know, came to the forefront. And uh, so, you know, I could always use her as an argument. But that lady is singing. And uh, yes, but she's, too much yeah, but she's it? from South Africa. <laughs> oh, she's not one of us. <laughs> she's not one of us. Okay, okay. But uh, I just, I just kept steady, and I had a wonderful grandfather. My grandfather was like the head of our family, uh, my maternal grandfather, and they thought they were doing something. They told him to give me a pep talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, and talk her out of it, yeah. Yes, and talk to talk me out of it, and I'll tell you. He said to me, he said, don't mind them. <laughs> did the exact opposite. <laughs> My grandfather did the exact. He says, you have a talent, and it's a gift from God. We didn't give it to you. You didn't find it yourself. So you're a very special person, and all I want you to do is always remember that this is God's gift, so you must use it to the best of your ability for your fellow man and blah, blah, blah. He was a lawyer as well. But that was it. And that pep talk was, uh, when, 1976 or so. So I never looked back. So when you look back now, in the 70s, um, you will not find a lot of young women no. in Liberia or anywhere okay. in West Africa singing. Mm -hmm. Has a lot changed now, especially oh, yes. in Liberia? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The singers abound. The young uh, female singers are there. I'm very proud of them. I hear names every day. I see acts. And, and, but I always tell them, listen, you guys are lucky. You're lucky the attitudes have changed. Now focus on the art. Because a lot of times I see glamour, you know, glamour fame. or fame as the objective, mm -hmm. whereas um, they need to concentrate and pay attention to the development of their art. Now when you sang that song of bar, and you're thinking of womanhood, and you're thinking of motherhood, mm -hmm. Would you say that that concept of womanhood, motherhood, that some of us grew up knowing that mother is supreme and all that, do you still see that in the true African sense in our society now? Especially when you look at what some men yeah. do to women in our communities. Well, you know, first of all, uh, uh, let's deal with the, the girls and the women. I don't know about Nigeria, but I think it's a phenomenon all over Africa now. Um, and in my country especially, uh, 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 we have a serious problem, uh, high rate of teenage pregnancy, uh, young girls who really are not fit to be mothers, and, and not fit in the sense of they're not developed enough, they're not mature enough, and um, the percentage of women now who, who want to be mothers as I knew my mother and yours. It's not there anymore, and it's very worrying. So what do we begin to do? Because I, I checked online and I noticed that you've had quite a few mentoring sessions that you've done for Liberian young men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it we need to begin to tell them? Because we, they will listen to someone like you because of your fame and what you've achieved in the music yeah. industry and outside of it. I talk, I, I, I talk to young girls and I talk to mothers. Uh, in Liberia, they have different categories of mothers. They say, baby ma. <laughs> that's the baby mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the baby's mother. She's never there. Mm -hmm. You know, she still wants to be going to the disco and stuff, leaving her children at home, etc. And tragedies happen in her absence and stuff. And then you have our ma, uh, meaning us, the older women who are trying to instill um, some kind of focus and discipline. As the grannies and aunties. And grannies oh. and aunties. And then, of course, you do have a percentage of young women who are true mothers, even in combining their um, occupation. Hmm. Yes. So, uh, our society then, if we want it to evolve, we need some more education 
for the young generation of mothers to come. Oh well, yes, we do. And uh, are we doing enough no, as we, communities? No, we're not doing enough. We're not What's doing stopping enough. Us? Well, what is stopping us is that, first of all, the media has been overtaken by a lot of foreign culture, a lot of foreign movies. Our kids are watching the movies, they're watching the videos, and uh, they want to think that that's the way it is. And I don't see enough of us um, countering it. I have to tell you, I, I fight with my Nigerian friends, my actor colleagues and actresses, because they hold a magic wand today on this continent. Um, the power of Nigerian movie is right across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, even you get to South Africa, and my South African uh, girlfriends are saying, Chineke, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's so much power, and yet, and yet, I'm seeing stories where every other young girl is trying to take somebody's husband, every mother is going to the juju man, so her daughter, you know, and, and I keep asking, where are these stories coming from? Are there no Other. true families? Are there no true uh, uh, people with values? Are there no mothers good who are, stories can be Good told. stories can be told. And, and we need to do that more, not to fall into the junk, as I call it, not to fall into the junk if, we need, if we're going to give our people some kind of direction. Okay, uh, like I was just I was listening to Kokolio yesterday, <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is a real dance tune from the seventies, and, mm -hmm. and I thought, what inspired that? And then the language, you you kind of like mixed. I'm not I'm not really sure because there were some words you used that I couldn't even Kokolio understand. Ko, yes. Kokolio ko. What does it mean? Now Creole with a talk. Where did cock the crow money? Early cock money. Kokolio mm -hmm. for wake people. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. That's what Kukuriyoko is. Early yes. morning, the cock is crowing. Mm. So in my mind, I just slipped the, the other little thing inside about making love because I found out... Um, Sorry? Yeah, I found out that <laughs> men wake up in the morning ready to make love. <laughs> yes. And so it's like, please, give, <laughs> yes, give me a break. <laughs> Well, you know from whence we came now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this, uh, uh, this is <laughs> an ambassador's daughter. You see, <laughs> who <laughs> decided, in spite of all the education all over the world, decided to be a singer <laughs> and an actress. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. now she's telling us about Kokorio. Yeah, but he asked me now. Yes. Which words you didn't understand? What we say, chicken the crow for day. Yes. Uh, that's pigeon. Uh -huh. That's crow. Yes. yes. Chicken the yes. crow because money don't come. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Uh -uh. It they bug me. Say, make we try. Uh, please, uh, yes. excuse me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My question is, how did, you, how did you convince your father eventually mm -hmm. to accept that you were going to be a singer and there was no two ways about it? I don't think I convinced him until I came out with my first album on EMI in 1978. And there was a beautiful ballad that I did on that album. It's called The Lullaby. And it's, it's, it's a mother's lament for her stolen child. In the crew dialect, which is one of the uh, languages in Liberia. And I was in London. Yeah, because he had given up on me. Uh, you know, there was not much <laughs> communication there. So I did this beautiful album and everything, and I m sent it to him, especially. And I said, I want you to listen, listen to and then tell me what you think. Yeah. And he did, and he called me back and said, mm, not bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, not That's bad. Different. And he said... Um, I think your best performance was in the lullaby. Mm. And he says, so you should always try to stay within that feeling of your music. But that was the endorsement there. 1978, he finally accepted. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things I know that it will be unfair to conclude this interview without dwelling on is international media still refer to Liberia as a war-ravaged nation it is 
how do you feel and how do you think this can go on? Because you did mention just before we came on air that uh, you now live in Monrovia. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? How do I feel about living in Monrovia? No, no, about the fact that it's been a country that had so much to itself, but mm -hmm. unfortunately the war and the seasons and the periods of uh, uh, John Doe and uh, Taylor mm -hmm. and the execution mm -hmm. of Talbert and all that history. And where were you during the war anyway? Oh, I ran away first to Ghana. <laughs> then I came to Nigeria. And um, when I felt my brothers in West Africa through Echo Mark seemed to have lost the direction I went to America. I came back from America in 2003. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But on your question, it's war ravaged. It's war ravaged. And um, I guess when I'm talking to Nigerians, I have to say that 40 years after your own small war, or the Easterners will tell you their country is still ravaged. I saw that back in 1994 when I went to um, Aruchuku for the first time. Uh, yes, um, for my brother Tom Onyadu's funeral. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, there were remnants of a war that had been fought. So if Nigeria, if the quote East has yet to recover after 40 years, it's going to take longer for Liberia. Is uh, uh, the Africa's first ever elected female president, is she doing enough? Is she succeeding as uh, president of Liberia? And that's uh, Salif Johnson. You know, um, I support Mrs. Salif because she's a woman. I want her to succeed. Is she doing enough? What can she do? What? You know, I, I, sometimes I'm critical, but sometimes when I sit and think of the challenges of Liberia, you know, it's not just about putting the infrastructure. It's not just about fixing the roads. It's not just about these ideas of, um, you know, IMF, World Bank policies, etc. It's about a nation totally devastated. And, and, and Psyche. you know, it's, it's, it's scary when you sit to think about it. Uh, the Carter, Carter Center informed us Liberians last year that we have about 40% of people living with mental illness of, or on the verge as a result of the war. Hmm. Yes. 40. 40%. I would even say, I would even say more. it's more than that. Because what people saw, what children saw, what young people were involved in, it's not something that's going to go away in 10 years. So we're dealing with all of these. Yes, um, some say Mrs. Selif is doing, uh, you know, what political leaders do, trying to balance it. Some of us say it is not enough. But then being there, seeing it on a daily basis, it's not going to be you know, nobody. It's not going to be enough. Mm. No. Okay, well, we will have to wrap up now, and we mm. do want you to sing us a song. Maybe you'll sing us Kokoriko. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So, Alera, over to you. Loaded. Let's wrap up. You've been railroaded. <laughs> yeah? We have and specifically, railroaded. specifically <laughs> Kokoriko. No, sing us a good song, but yeah, maybe Kokoriko. I like the Kokoriko. <laughs> no, but you know what? I've got this new one that I, I've written specifically um, for the leaders in Africa, etc., and uh, it's